Hi, everyone, and thanks for joining today on our Ask Me Anything webinar. I'm Chris Breike. I'm the founder and CEO of StockSpot. And now I answer a lot of questions day to day uh, from our clients by email. And, and I also make quite a few YouTube videos to answer common questions. But today is actually our very first Ask Me Anything webinar. And I'm really looking forward to answering some live questions from um, all of our clients here on the call today. Uh, now, quickly, just before we get started, I'll just run you through the format of today and a little bit of housekeeping. So the session is going to go for about half an hour, give or take. Um, and if you do have to drop off at some point during the session, don't worry about it. Um, you will get a copy of the webinar straight after the session um, by email. So you can watch it later if you want. Um, everything in the webinar as well is general advice. So just keep in mind that even though I'm answering some questions from, from you and from other clients, then this isn't personal advice and it's really just general advice. Um, if you do have a question, that's fantastic. That's what the session's for. You can ask them on the panel in the right, which is, says uh, post a comment, which you should be able to see there. Um, we've already got a few questions that have come in from clients earlier today via email. So I'm going to probably start by answering some of those, but then I'd love to answer other questions from people on the webinar. So please post your questions. Um, I'll try and answer as many as I can in the half an hour, but I might not get a chance to answer all of them. So if I don't answer any of your questions today, I'll do my best to answer them by email over the next few days. So look out for that response later on. Um, now, if your video looks a little bit grainy, um, there is a way of solving that. You can see at the bottom of your screen, there's a little cogwheel. If you click on that, you should be able to change the visual resolution of your screen to 1080, which should stop any pixelation. So I'd suggest doing that now. Uh, now, without further ado, it's over to you. So let's get started. And I'll start with a few of the questions that we've had emailed through from clients um, over the last couple of days. So question number one, with inflation at six to 7%, we're told that we're losing money by putting our money in a in, in high interest account, um, but where can we put our money so that it isn't losing value? Um, so this is a question we're getting more and more these days or similar questions because interest rates are much higher than they were and um, inflation is also high. So the advice that we give to clients is always to have some money set aside for your um, short-term expenses and any emergencies that you might have. And we typically recommend somewhere between three to six months worth of, of cash flow. You should just have in a high interest savings account, even though you might be losing to inflation a little bit there, just to protect against the risk of something happening or you're needing money in the short term. Uh, for money that you don't need soon, you know, I do think it doesn't make sense to leave it in a savings account because it probably will be eroded by inflation regardless of what interest rates are over time. And so historically, investing that money, you know, is a good way of protecting against inflation. Um, if you want to hone in on what are the particular sectors or assets that have done better during high inflation environments, look, historically, they're assets like resources and energy shares, you know, gold and natural resources, um, real property is another example. Um, these are the sort of assets that do particularly well when inflation's high. The problem is that no one really knows, you know, how long inflation is going to stay high for or how high interest rates are going to go. And so our advice to all clients is not just to own these, you know, more inflation focused assets um, only, but to make sure you're diversified across a range of different assets that also do well in different economic scenarios. You know, for instance, when interest rates are lower, typically government bonds will do well or when interest rates are falling at least, um, or long long duration um, shares that have a lot of growth embedded in them like tech shares. So we like to spread money across everything um, and we think that's a great way of protecting against inflation over the long run. But at any point in time, you should expect some investments in your portfolio to do a bit better and some to do a bit worse. That's just the nature of diversification. Uh, the next question. So why is it better to invest with StockSpot instead of just investing into the ETFs themselves? Um, so investing into ETFs, um, I think is also a fantastic option for people that want to be a bit more self-directed and manage your own money. Um, you know, what you'll need to be aware of is that it's going to take a bit more time and a bit more effort. And there's going to be a few things that you'll need to take over yourself and be confident to do yourself. And, and really I'd put them in a few different buckets. So the first one is you'll need to go off and select the right ET ETFs for you. Um, now, these days, there's about 250 different ETFs listed on the stock exchange. You can find those lists in different places, like on the ASX website. They've got a great list of all the ETFs. And you'll have to look for each asset class and each type of investment you want to in invest in, what is the right ETF for you. So, for instance, even within Australian shares these days, there's 30 or so different options you can choose from. So that's step one. Then you'll have to make sure you've got the right asset allocation, so the right mix of different ETFs based on your personal 
circumstances, your investment time horizon, you know, any cash flow needs you need for dividends and that sort of thing, and also your capacity to weather ups and downs in the market, which we call your risk capacity. Um, so making sure your asset allocation matches to that is the second step I'd be focusing on. Um, then you want to set up some alerts so you can rebalance your portfolio whenever needed. So we for our clients, automate rebalancing. So as soon as your portfolio moves a certain distance from what we say is your target allocation, we'll automatically do some buying and selling to get the risk back into, into kilter with where it should be. Um, that's something you'll need to keep an eye on yourself and, and really be focused on doing it when it when it um, when those alerts um, happen. You know, sometimes they don't last very long. So for instance, in March 2020, when markets collapsed, we did a lot of rebalancing for clients around that March. April period in 2020, you know, selling some government bonds that had done well at that period and buying into shares. But you've only got a window of sometimes a few days or if you're lucky, a few weeks to do that. So you'll be, need to be focused on the market to be able to do that rebalancing at the right time. Um, and then the final thing I think you need to focus on if you're managing your own ETF portfolio is just, and I think this is the toughest one, having the discipline to actually do nothing for most of the time. Because, you know, I know from my experience and from seeing a lot of other friends that have invested, there's already always so many temptations to tinker with your portfolio and make changes based on, you know, maybe an article you've read in the newspaper, a tip you've got from your friend. I think the discipline to say no and just stick with your plan is actually quite tough for a lot of people. So making sure you've automated things and you're actually going to stick with your plan, you know, I think is probably the most critical if you're going to manage your own ETF portfolio. Um, so the next question is, uh, hello, I'm moving to Canada this year. Am I able to deposit from my Canadian bank account into Stockspot? Um, the answer to this one's quite simple. Um, Stockspot only accepts at the moment deposits from Australian bank accounts. So if you do want to invest from Canada, there's a few things you need to do. First of all, let Stockspot know that you're moving so we can update your details and make sure that you're listed as a non-resident for tax purposes. And then secondly, you'll need to deposit first of all into an Australian bank account and then into Stockspot after that. So hopefully you left it at a bank account in Australia that you can deposit into and then transfer um, as a second step into Stockspot. Um, so the next question, and, and this is a bit more of a, a technical question, are ETF share prices based on how many people invest in that fund? And if people don't place their money in the ETF, would the share prices of the ETFs go down? Um, so this question is sort of in two parts. So the, to answer the first part of your question, the ETF price itself doesn't really tell you that much. Um, because an ETF issuer, and they're the likes of the, the Vanguards or the BlackRocks or the beta shares or the Global Xs of the world, um, they can launch an ETF by issuing, um, let's say, 1 million units at $10, or they could issue 10 million units at $1, and ultimately it means the same thing. It's the same underlying investments. It doesn't really mean a lot. And so that's really a choice of the issuer what the first um, share price is of an ETF when it lists. You know, these days, probably the trend that we're seeing is that ETF issuers are favoring lower share prices just to make it easier to buy smaller denominations because there's a lot of people that want to purchase small amounts of ETFs these days. You know, for instance, for our clients, we're making top ups when you put $500 in your cash account. So we want to be able to buy, you know, as many um, units as possible and as close to that $500 as possible as well. Um, so, you know, really that the price itself is pretty meaningless when it comes to ETFs. Um, the second question is if there's no, no one buying the ETF, does it mean the ETF price will go down? Interesting technical question, and it's probably a little bit different to shares. So when shares are listed on the share market, if you've got no buyers, it means you've got no demand, and probably it means that the share price is going to fall until you find that demand again. With ETFs, it's a bit different. If you've got no buyers of an ETF, um, it doesn't necessarily mean the ETF price will fall. And that's because what's a lot more important with an ETF is the demand and supply for the underlying investments within the ETF. So as, as long as there's buyers and sellers for the underlying shares, and, and for instance, if it was in an ASX 300 ETF, you know, it would be the demand for companies like BHP and Telstra and Woolworths. As long as there's buyers and sellers for those, the ETF price probably won't move at all or it will continue just to match the value of those underlying investments. Uh, what happens in practice if there's no buyers and sellers of an ETF is that market makers, who are these people that are paid to be there and providing a price all the time, they will be in there providing a buy price and a sell price all the time. So you are able to transact. And, and that's another big difference of ETFs is that there is a group um, that the ETF issuers will employ to always be in the market with a buy and sell so you can get in and out at a fair market price um, while the market's open. 
Um, so the next question, um, which is better to invest for a child's junior education when it comes to, uh, and, and with tax implications? So investment bonds or one of the stock spot investment portfolio strategies? Um, please explain in terms of fees and tax. Um, so investment bonds and, and ETFs are both quite popular ways of investing for, for kids or grandchildren or for relatives. Um, investment bonds have been around for a bit longer. Um, and, and probably the big difference is that they're actually not categorized in the investment category, they're actually part of an insurance product. Um, so that's why they're often known as insurance bonds as well. Um, we don't actually offer them or provide advice on insurance products. So I can't provide any advice on this, but I can provide a bit of information on the differences, um, which also, if you're interested in more details, we've actually written quite a detailed blog on the Stockspot blog, if you search investment bonds, uh, where you can find a bit more on this comparison. You know, what I'd say is that investment bonds have a bit of a unique tax structure where they're actually taxed within the, um, the investment bond while you own it. So you basically pay income tax and capital gains tax indirectly through the fund while you hold it. You know, there's also some quite strict rules around how long you need to own an investment bond um, to be able to sell it. And it's 10 years you have to hold it to not be penalized to exit. Um, the benefit at the end of that is that you can transfer ownership to your child or your grandchild without there being any tax consequences at that point. Um, the disadvantage that we see with investment bonds are often their fees are quite high. And so some of these tax benefits are eroded by the fact that you're paying a lot of cost every year and that's eating, eating into your return. Um, and that's probably one of the big differences with ETFs is that their costs are much lower. You know, when it comes to investing for kids, we don't actually charge any stock spot management fees at all up to $10,000 or until they charge 18. So we can keep the cost down, but then you'll need to consider the tax consequences yourself, you know, around having to pay the, um, you know, capital gains at some point, as well as tax on income while your portfolio is running for your child, as well as potentially the capital gains impact of transferring ownership um, down the down the path. So there are some differences, you know, worth reading that blog if you want some more information on the differences, because investment bonds are quite complex products. Um, but if you want advice on that, I'd, I'd recommend speaking to someone that's qualified to give advice on on investment bonds or insurance bonds. Um, so the next question, can I elect to have distributions automatically reinvested back into the ETFs? Um, so I think what you're referring to is a dividend reinvestment plan, um, which is basically a way of reinvesting dividends or distributions into a company. Um, you know, probably a lot of people on this webinar will have heard of these before when it comes to direct companies like, you know, CBA or BHP or West Farmers, all of these sorts of larger companies have offered DRPs for a long time. It's a great way of reinvesting your dividends and enjoying more capital growth over time if you don't actually need the distributions and uh, avoiding brokerage, which is one of the big benefits. You know, historically, you can sometimes get a bit of a discount when you're using a DRP as well, but there's probably fewer companies that are offering that these days. Um, now, when it comes to Stockspot, we don't actually um, offer a DRP. And the reason is that we actually use distributions and dividends for rebalancing portfolios. So making sure that if you're getting distributions, it's going into the underweight assets in your portfolio to keep your portfolio balanced and in line with your uh, risk capacity and with the strategy, um, you know, risk. Um, so, you know, we automatically reinvest dividends in that way. Um, because we're not charging brokerage, the end result is probably not too different, that you are reinvesting and your portfolio is enjoying the ability for more capital growth over time. But we're not always investing it back into the same ETF that the dividend comes from. It can actually be invested into other ETFs as well. Um, all right, now a few questions from all of you on the webinar. So the first question says, hey, Chris, I noticed that the stock spot has a large overweight position in emerging market shares. This seems to have dragged returns down given the region's poor performance. You know, any reason for the large overweight and not have more developed shares? Keen for your thoughts and insights. Um, good question. And one we're getting a bit these days, you know, what I've noticed over the years is there's always going to be an asset in our portfolios that's underperforming and one that's outperforming. You know, clients love the ones that are outperforming and doing well. And always, you know, there's a bit of reluctance to continue staying invested in those ones that are underperforming. You know, what I'd say is in designing our portfolios, what we've tried to do is build a portfolio that can weather different types of economic circumstances, whether it's high growth or low growth, you know, whether it's high inflation, low inflation, and the same with interest rates. And by having a mix of assets that perform differently in those different scenarios can ultimately give you a more smooth investment return over the long run. Now, in, 
emerging market shares actually have quite different characteristics to um, developed market shares, you know, and perform differently in different scenarios. So provide quite good diversification and balance in a portfolio. Um, ultimately, though, there may be periods where they underperform global shares or Australian shares or outperform. Um, you know, and over the last 10 years, I think global shares have really benefited from a low interest rate environment um, because there are a lot of high growth companies and particularly in the US market, you know, tech, technology companies that are being valued based on growth well into the future. And so companies that have a lot of growth embedded in them tend to do well in a lower interest rate environment, which is why, to a large extent, we've seen much better performance from developed markets and particularly the US over the last 10 years. Um, plus, these companies have been doing fantastically and growing. You know, whether that will be the case for the next 10 years is another question. Um, it is certainly possible that that trend continues or, or maybe not. You know, we're not really in the business of trying to predict which asset class is going to do best for the next year or two years or five years, but making sure that our clients have a mix of assets to perform in different environments. You know, what I'd say also about emerging markets is historically in periods of higher inflation, emerging markets have done better. Um, a lot of emerging markets are commodity exporters. And so by earning the income from homo higher commodity prices, these countries tend to do um, better as well. Um, and they tend to also do better in periods where the US dollar is a little bit weaker. Um, so I'd say, look, they add a different characteristic to your portfolio. You know, I know, I, I know that our allocation is higher than a lot of super funds out there. Um, but actually, it matches up much more closely to the underlying um, GDP of countries and, and their contribution to the world. So emerging markets these days actually contribute, I believe nowadays, over 50% um, of the um, GDP to the world. And so having a significant allocation of them to your portfolio, I think, is the right thing to be doing um, over the long run. Um, the next question is, how often do you review the balance of the portfolios, e.g. the allocation to different markets of the ETFs? Um, you know, an another great question. Um, this is something we're constantly reviewing. So, you know, we're constantly assessing um, both the um, underlying asset classes with our, within our portfolio and whether they're in the right allocation. Um, so whether we've got the right percentages in the different um, building blocks. Um, this isn't something I think people should be changing very often over the long run um, for a few reasons. One is you don't want to be rebalancing all the time because of the tax impact. But ultimately, um, you know, what happens is that um, markets, um, we believe, you know, over the long run will give you a good return by just owning everything and making sure you're diversified and have a, a smart and simple strategic asset allocation. Um, so the only times where we've really made changes in the past is where we believe that some of those inputs into that model have changed significantly. And the inputs into working out what allocations there are really are three for us, which is expected returns of the asset class, expected volatility, which is the ups and downs in the asset class, and then the correlations, which is the relationship between the performance and returns of the different asset classes. And, and what we've tended to see over time is that, you know, our long term assumptions around returns and volatility don't tend to change very much around these asset classes. Um, however, what does seem to change a bit more is the correlations, the relationships. And in the current environment, you know, what was certainly noticeable last year in 2022 was that shares and bonds, which have historically at least uh, moved in opposite directions. So generally bonds do better when shares aren't doing well and vice versa. Because we're now in, in an in environment of higher interest rates and higher inflation, they're having a higher correlation. They're moving in the same direction. And that's why our portfolios are probably looking a little bit more defensive than uh, a typical super fund, but also explains our higher allocation to gold in the portfolios, uh, because historically in those higher inflation environments where gold, um, well, gold is able to actually, you know, lift the portfolio performance when those two asset classes are po performing poorly at the same time. So we're reviewing them all the time. And it's the same with the underlying ETFs within the portfolio. You know, as I mentioned earlier in the webinar, there's over 250 these days. So there's a lot to keep an eye on. Um, but ultimately, it's not something I think you need to be changing very often as long as you get it right at the start. You know, we've now been investing for almost 10 years now in the same core ETFs. And I think they've done fantastically. You know, our global share ETF has outperformed most of the other global share ETFs. Um, largely because it has a bit more of a US centricity as well as a, a bigger weighting to large cap stocks, which have done better. 
you know, our Australian ETF, the Vanguard product, you know, wasn't always the biggest product in Australia. And when we started to recommend it back in 2013, 2014, it was um, probably the second or third largest um, Australian shares ETF, but it's continued to grow its assets and continued to lower fees for member for um, investors, which is great. Um, and, and equally with the other ETFs we invest in, we think they're the right long-term investment. So we're watching it all the time, but that doesn't mean I think you should be acting all the time or making changes, you know, and, and, and like I said earlier, having the discipline to do nothing most of the time, I think adds a lot of value for investing generally. Um, how can we invest for uh, God kids? Um, well, another good question. I would say probably in the same way as investing for your children. Um, you can look at the Stockspot um, Kids option as one option, and there's certainly other investment products you can consider as well. Um, and some of those factors I mentioned earlier are good ones to consider. Um, what are the fees? What are the tax implications? You know, is is it something you want to participate with your godchild in, in terms of, you know, it's part of an education process, so you might want access to an app or other materials to share, or is it something you just want to make that investment and then pass it on in the future? I think all of these are considerations to think about um, in order to choose the right product, um, you know, and, and, and how involved you want them to be in the process. But I think um, ETFs is a great way of giving kids both exposure to um, a growing asset over the long run, um, but also allows allows you to have that conversation with them or with them and, and their parents, you know, about the benefits of investing, the benefits of having the discipline to invest and help them learn about the share market, which I think is really important. You know, I feel very blessed that my parents taught me quite early about shares, but it's not something they teach in schools in Australia. And I, I'm I'm always sad to see how little people know about personal finances and particularly investing leaving school. So, you know, if it's something you can have a conversation with your godchild about, that's fantastic. Uh, next question. So a few competitors of Stockspot have introduced REIT type ETFs in their offerings. Given Australia is a property hyped market, what are you planning, what are you planning for in that space? Um, yeah, good question. And, and it's not just our competitors. I mean, super funds as well, often one of their core asset classes is REITs or property. Um, you know, our view is actually within our Australian shares ETF and some of our global shares ETFs, you already get exposure to property as an asset class. So, um, you know, we, our view is by adding it separately into your portfolio, you're really doubling up on that exposure, which is not really necessary. It's, it's really no different to adding extra of another sector of the market that already exists within the share market parts of your portfolio. So we don't um, by default add REITs as a separate asset class. And certainly that's been a good call for the last few years because REITs haven't done very well. They were one of the worst performing assets last year. And so being diversified into other sectors of the market were important. Um, however, for clients that really want more of a REIT exposure, um, we actually offer it as a, th a theme. So if you look into Stockspot themes on the website, you'll see that the, the Vanguard Australian property ETF is an option you can add into your portfolio as a theme if you want to boost your exposure to property. Um, but I, I would broadly say it's not something you need to do and you get enough exposure to that asset class already within the portfolio. And for a lot of Aussies that already own their own home, I mean, you've already got a lot of exposure to property anyway. Um, next question, when and under what circumstances is buy only for rebalancing better than always rebalancing? Um, so yeah, for those um, on the webinar who don't know uh, what this is referring to, so within the dashboard that you have for Stockspot, the web dashboard, you can choose between a few different rebalancing settings. Um, by default, we, we set everyone to always rebalance, which means that when you're investments move a certain distance from their target allocation, we will do a bit of buying and selling to get it back into whack to make sure you're taking the right amount of risk. We also give people the choice of rebalancing less frequently. Um, so um, only rebalancing as you're getting more distributions and dividends, which is buy only, or not rebalancing at all, which is called pause rebalancing. You know, where do we see people using that um, that buy only rebalancing? Well, it's typically for people that are contributing regularly to their portfolios. So they'd rather be using those contributions to be rebalancing rather than buying and selling the portfolio. Um, because although we try and minimize the tax consequences by doing this quite infrequently, and also the fact that ETFs are quite tax in inefficient, when you do rebalance, there is a tax event um, that will sometimes lead to you having to realize capital gains. So if it's something you really want to avoid for your own tax situation and you're comfortable with the portfolio drifting or moving a little bit further from its target allocation, that's probably when you'd use that buy only setting. Um, what I'd also say is if you do use it, don't be 
too concerned that your portfolio will move too far out of whack because it's something that we're still focusing on for clients. Um, and quarterly, we, we do a review of all clients to see any that are on these settings who have moved um, far away from their target allocation. And we'll send you a warning email just to let you know that this has happened and give you the opportunity if you want to rebalance back or um, to allow your portfolio to keep on um, growing in the way that it is. Um, next question uh, from uh, Daniel. So can an SMSF invest in StockSpot and would you suggest it as a core or satellite holding? Um, so to, to answer the first part of your question, yes, um, SMSFs um, can invest with StockSpot. I, I know this because I have my own SMSF invested with StockSpot. Um, and in terms of where it fits within a portfolio, I mean, it's really up to you. Um, because we're investing into low cost diversified ETFs, I think it makes sense as a core part of the portfolio because you get that broad exposure to lots of different asset classes. Um, and for most SMSFs, when you have to select your investment strategy or or determine your investment tr strategy as the trustee, you know, diversification across a lot of asset classes is usually part of that investment strategy you've set up. You know, keep in mind that you will need to make sure that the stock spot strategy is in line with the strategy you're allowed to actually implement as the trustee of that SMSF, which is something that you're going to need to do. Um, if you do want to have a satellite approach as well, yeah, you have a few options. One is to go off and set up other investments in other places where you can access those satellites, um, or you can use the stock spot themes option where we have a curated list of about 20 or so other ETFs where you can add them into your SMSF. So for mine personally, that's what I do. I have a a bunch of the StockSpot core ETFs in there. And then I can, if I want, add other thematic ETFs in there just to add a, make them a bit more differentiated. Um, it's not something you really need to do, but if you want a bit more personal flavor to your ETF, that's an option. Um, question from Robert. I have multiple ETFs invested with StockSpot, um, CMC and Raise. I salary sacrifice 5% super every fortnight. Is it a good idea to have such a big spread or should I consolidate a bit more? Um, again, this is really up to you personally. Um, it, it, again, it depends on what your own personal circumstances are. And if you're using these different investments for different timeframes or different buckets, I don't know if you're using one for short-term savings or long-term, you know, I think it makes sense generally in life to not overcomplicate things too much. And because you're already getting good diversification, you know, hopefully in all of these different options, you know, picking one might make sense. You know, with any provider, it's obviously important to make sure that they're aligned with your investment philosophy and you're comfortable with the risks that you're taking and, and the opportunities that are there. Um, you know, it sounds like from some of those providers, you've got to decide, do you want a more automated solution or do you want to be more doing it yourself? Or if, if you want to do a bit of both, then it might make sense to keep a few of these accounts open. Um, but really, it's up to you. Um, some of our clients have accounts with different service providers. Some just have accounts with StockSpot. Um, you know, you've got to weigh up your own personal situation and consider things like how much um, involvement you want to have. Um, but then also consider at the end of the tax year, but the more different options you have, the more complex your tax is going to be because you're going to have to gather tax statements from lots of different providers to send to your accountant or to manage your own my tax. So uh, yeah, really up to you. Um, I don't think there's a, a wrong answer, but it depends how involved you want to be in your own investing. Um, so another question, how much um, is the minimum investment um, to start off an account with StockSpot? So our minimum um, starting amount for a StockSpot account in terms of getting it invested is $2,000. Um, but we do have a lot of clients that set up an account and start chipping in with smaller amounts of money to start off with. And once it gets to 2000, we'll start investing it into ETFs for you. Um, we actually just re introduced a new bank um, partner for StockSpot a few months ago that's providing a, a really good interest rate on any cash that's sitting aside there. It's currently 4%. Um, so, you know, I expect there'll probably be more people that start to top up and, and um, build um, that first $2,000 within that 4% interest account. And once it hits um, $2,000, that's when we'll invest it for you. Once you've made that initial $2,000 investment, every time your balance gets over $500 is when we'll start to tip it into more investments for you. Um, so we've tried to keep it as low as possible. Um, you know, one of the differences, I guess, with StockSpot is that you actually own all of the ETFs yourself. They're all in your own name, you know, legally and beneficially. You're not in some sort of commingled structure or some fund structure where you're sharing these ETFs with other people. And so you get your own HIN, which is your own holder identification number at the exchange, which really I think provides a lot of assurity um, because it, you can be very confident that if anything ever happened to StockSpot as a business, your investments and assets are protected because they're owned by you. 
Um, and that's the reason why we have to have a minimum because the ASX actually imposes minimums for the amount of ETFs that you um, can buy as a starting point. Um, and a question from, from Anne, um, and the question is, are there any AI ETFs? Um, so, Anne, we actually just published an ETF research paper a couple of days ago, which you should be able to find on the uh, website under um, research or under insights. And if you click on the ETF research um, tab, you'll be able to find this and, and I'll send it to you afterwards. Um, in that research, we actually looked at the last 12 months trends in the ETF landscape. And funnily enough, one of the better performing groups of ETFs were those exposed to um, AI and, and um, that sort of area of the share market. You know, these ETFs are what, what we would describe as thematic ETFs. Rather than giving you broad market exposure, they're really focused on a very small segment of the market. Um, so they do add a bit of risk to your portfolio, but they can give you, you know, a good return if you get your timing right and you get the area of the market right. Um, from memory, there are two that are more focused in that particular area. One is the semiconductor ETF, um, and semiconductors are actually an important component into a lot of those AI models, and that's why those ETF, that ETF, and the underlying investments have been doing quite well. Um, and as well as that, there's a robotics and AI ETF, and, and that has quite broad exposure to that theme. Um, so they're the two to look at. We don't offer them at Stockspot, but you can obviously go off and research them yourselves. Um, I would just give a little bit of a warning when it comes to thematic ETFs. The reason why we, you know, always, um, you know, exercise a bit of caution is that what we see is that these exciting ETFs tend to get the most interest and inflows and launch at the peak of excitement, which then leads to a trough of disillusion, disillusionment after, afterwards when they underperform. So just be a little bit careful when you're picking um, thematic ETFs that you've got the right amount of time to actually see that theme through. You're not looking to make money in three months or six months because these things can be quite volatile. You know, time horizon is really important um, and being able to stick with it because they can go through quite volatile periods. You know, a good similar example is about a year and a half ago, there was a whole bunch of new ETFs launching that were cryptocurrency ETFs, but they launched around the peak of cryptocurrency excitement and very soon after fell by about 50%. And so you have to be aware that these things can actually fall. Um, coincidentally, those ETFs have now been some of the best performers over the last year. So expect more volatility, but certainly those AI ETFs um, are ones that are available. Um, unfortunately, that's all we've got time for today. It's, um, it's uh, up to the half an hour. So thanks everyone that's been on the webinar. I hope you learned something and, and got something out of it. I'm really sorry if I didn't get to answer your question on the webinar, but I will be answering it personally by email um, afterwards. And um, we'll also be sending a version of this webinar to you by email straight afterwards. So look out for that. Um, you know, thanks for all joining and um, have a great weekend.